Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Brian Thatcher, and welcome to Mercy Unbound. It's a show that aims to provide hope and avenue for healing, and one that will help you understand and then live the great mercy of God. With me today, I have a longtime friend, Trish Short. She was the one that uh, sang the Chapel of the Divine Mercy, the contemporary version several years ago that became so popular, it went all over the world. I remember traveling to countries like Malaysia and Singapore and Africa and in Africa, and uh, they were playing the Chapel of Divine Mercy, her version that she did for our ministry, Eucharistic Apostles. She's been working, she and her husband, Matt, for many years on a documentary called Misled about the myths and the lies of abortion. Uh, I, I watched it, it brought me to tears. There were so many testimonials in there that will touch your heart young women who've had abortion, men whose girlfriend or wife had an abortion, a doctor who was an abortionist and lost a child. And after that, he quit doing abortions. Uh, one thing after the other, people who've had complications they want to talk about. And it's just a beautiful documentary. And before I bring Trish on, I'd like you to watch this trailer of Misled. Life changed drastically from a leave it to beaver world to a clockwork orange world in the blink of an eye. So much of the current feminist movement is finding ways to exploit women, but making them fight for it, making them think it's in their own best interest to do so. What ended up happening is that choice started to only mean abortion. Why are people getting abortions? They've been told that they can't do it. And they're in a place where someone said they can fix a problem. I called my stepmom and she told me to get an abortion. It completely tore me apart. When Roe was overturned, everyone was like, well, now the work can begin. But in reality, if they were doing the work for the last 50 years, I would have my kid. That's the reality of it. The one way I believe that women are misled about the abortion industry is not thinking that they're a business. We never talked about what he was doing. When your spouse comes home from work and you ask how his day was, they're not going to stand there and say, oh, I had a great day. I killed five babies and made $2,000 today. I remember literally thinking, you know, my God, I'm throwing these kids in the garbage. It was the first time for me as a physician that I really saw how the abortion industry treats women. Finding out that the abortion numbers were so disproportionately high in the black community, it really made me think about why is no one talking about this? They were selling baby body parts to the tune of $7,000 a baby. I truly believed I had the silver bullet. Well, I was very naive. We buy the lie that it's a quick fix, and you think you can forget, but you don't forget. A lot of women are catching on to this and saying, hold on, this doesn't feel equal. I knew that this was a baby, and this baby was mine. This is a child. It's not going to end that day at all. You will remember this child. You'll remember his birthday. Tomorrow would have been my son's 27th birthday. Wow. <laughs> um. You know, Trish, just watching that uh, trailer brought tears to my eyes. I was thinking of the Russia-Ukraine situation, the bombing of hospitals, the mm -hmm. bombing of children's homes and a civil war again in Sudan, people killing each other and thinking of the Hamas, what they're doing to the women and children and prayed in dead bodies around. Life has no significance. Um, yeah. We've got to get back to a culture of life. You know, Trish, you and I have known each other for a long time and I've been waiting on you to get misled done. It yes. took you 20, 25 years and uh, we're both older. Yeah. What, what took you so long? You know, we started this 25 years ago, and we edited the piece together, Brian, 
and we brought in someone very qualified. He was a writer for Newsweek, for Time, and he's a very talented editor, and he watched our first edit of Ms. Led um, three, four years after we had shot it, and he said, Trish, it's too religious. It doesn't go with your title. And you know, Brian, when I did my first pro-life video, it was for some called Mercy Ministries of America. They're, they were building homes for a girls and unplanned pregnancy so they wouldn't have abortions. And I read that and I wanted to help them. And so I did my first one, um, which was really a fundraiser and a corporate piece for them. I found out so much about it and I knew that God was calling me to do more. And, you know, one day I was just in the house cleaning and um, a thought came into my head that I don't think was mine. I, I just think it's one of those things, uh, sort of a directory type thing. Um, produce something that shows how you were deceived. And I went, wow, what a concept. And uh, so I prayed about it and I asked the Lord to give me a name for the project because I had no idea what exactly uh, he wanted, what was needed. And so Ms. Led came into my mind that day, hours later. And that says everything, doesn't it? Because um, women are very deceived. There's a machine behind it. And so I began um, looking for a way to do it. A kindly gentleman gave us the seed money through an, a nonprofit friend of mine to start it. And so we did and to do it. And when we got that edit and someone very qualified said, it's too religious, it doesn't go with your title, I was heartbroken because I knew that was true, right? So um, we went back to the drawing board over and over again, many, many years, throwing money at it and doing more interviews, but for whatever the reason, and we are, Matt and I are producers, we're award-winning, and um, it's not like we don't know what to do. It's just you can't script a documentary. And it wasn't hitting my heart. And then I never gave up on it. I call it a humble stumble. I had to carry that cross and have people think what they would, but we never stopped working on it. It's just we, we knew it had to say what the title said. And um, fast forward, to, you know, two and a half years ago, right before Roe was overturned, um, this thing took off like a rocket. And Matt and I would cry out in prayer every morning during our rosary, me especially being post-abortive. I'd cry out and say, what do you want, Lord? What do you want? Bring the people you want. Well, Brian, when we started this project, people who were in it weren't even born yet. <laughs> they were not even born yet. Um, the, the main people who really speak to the culture today were either not born or were, were little kids at the time right? So um, there's a thing called God's timing, and we don't like God's timing. And it can be incredibly painful. You think of St. Monica praying for Augustine. You think of those 20 years. It's that kind of thing. So we say we, we gave birth to a 25-year-old baby when this thing was done, <laughs> and we knew it was done. You could feel it in your heart. You could see it, right? You know that one thing I liked about the documentary was that you have so many different testimonies. It's fast moving. I mean, you talk, start out, I believe, early on talking about uh, a lady talks about adoption, mm -hmm. uh, which is hardly talked about, but in a different types of adoptions and, and uh, just the difficulties women face. It's not an easy, easy decision. One thing I noticed is that you weren't in it. Yes. Um, why, why did you keep yourself out? Well, um, I was the producer and the director and I fired myself. I mean, that's, that's the long and the short of it. it we had always planned uh, that I would do the narrative and lead into the stories. And as it began editing together uh, with the new people that God brought, and these are all people from all backgrounds, Brian, you know, people of all backgrounds walk into clinics tragically, right? So I didn't want this to be a religious piece. God brought people of all backgrounds, faith, uh, you know, agnostic, uh, Catholic, evangelical, um, Democrat, Republican, all backgrounds were on there. And that's the good news is that 
the message of life, the, the pro-life message and the messaging that's out there is getting through. I mean, people are changing. We, we don't no longer live in a Kardashian culture, so to speak. There is a tide that's changing. Women are saying this is not a good deal. Something needs to change. And so when the stories came together, honestly, Brian, it, we, it would have been another $10,000. It would have been more production. And it, it really was finished, you know, and it was time to get it out for the culture. And um, I, just, I fired myself. I mean, there, was, there wasn't a reason for it. I tell my testimony live. It's powerful, uh, painful, um, but it wasn't needed for this. And I, as, as a producer director, I get to speak for the project when people ask. But, you know, no, I fired myself. So that's why I'm not in it. It wasn't needed. You know, one thing I liked also was uh, a lady spoke about the effect of minorities and how abortions hit the black race particularly hard. Mm -hmm. and, and early on years ago, they noticed that and that kind of got pushed to the side. Um, one of my podcasts I did maybe nine months ago was on the relationship of uh, abortion and slavery. And it's mm -hmm. funny because many of the same topics or themes that they use to justify slavery, they use for abortion. I, it, it's fascinating if, if you um, look at that. Now, what what did you learn from going through this whole process? This has been a painful birth here. Well, many things that um, just because God calls you to something doesn't mean he's going to give that thing that he's asked you to do right away. You have to have patience. Faith is not... Um, Hey, I'm going to do this. It's going to happen just because I there was an inspiration that came through prayer or whatever. Um, I, if faith is looked out day by day, and when you know God has asked for something, you stick to it. I mean, regardless of what others think, regardless of any of those things, you have to be faithful in in the call. And we don't always have it all figured out. It takes it's a journey. And he, I, for whatever the reason, um, he, he wanted it this way. It's clear from the edit of the documentary when it turned out so powerfully, the, the remarks we're getting on it are incredible. Um, agnostics um, taking a look at this and saying, you know, if somebody were to watch this, they would have, have to ask themselves, were they misled? And women the marriage component in this, the adoption component in this, on top of the looks behind the scenes of um, PRCs, people doing frontline work, the, it's, we wanted the heart of what is actually going on, you know, the truth of what's actually going on, not what is being told. And so I learned in working with all these people and all of, the, of all these different ways who are walking out the pro-life message in very creative ways, unexpected ways, that we all can work together. And I, I think that's one of the things that I learned over and over again in doing this is why aren't we working together? I think the voices are diverse. They're unexpected. They aren't the people you see all the time. And um, we don't live in a vacuum, you know, what, what you have to offer, or I have to offer, any one of those people on Ms. Led have to offer is totally different and unique. And is part of that unique tapestry that God has put together in the, in, within his people. I think that's so important. I hope people watch this and see the diversity of backgrounds thought, uh, ways of looking at this problem, ways of trying to help it get better uh, from the feminist aspect, which Destiny speaks so uh, uh, eloquently on, to April and Jay in a crisis pregnancy, and now they have seven kids, and how they walk that out to Sherilyn in the Black community with this huge family talking about how it's being proffered, that children are such a burden. Why is this? Um, or that women are sold so cheaply. And the lastly, the thing I learned was, um, you know, the over, over sexualization of the culture, um, birth control that led to sexual abuse and abandonment, destruction of the family, all of those things that were foretold that would happen when 
birth control became the norm, right? Um, I pray that men look at this and know they're not off the hook, you know? Um, it isn't my construct, it's God's construct that men are to take care of the women, are to reverence women, are to protect women. And so the anger that you see today um, in the pro-choice movement, um, I look at these women and I'm thinking, this is the aftermath of the sexual revolution when the men dumped the home, no fault divorce, you know, men are going to have to triple down on this and really work hard to begin to reverence women again. And women are going to have to be aware that we're not men. And why take on this aggression when we are the sort of the feminine genius, as John Paul, St. John Paul called women, um, when we have this ability that no one else has had, has in our womanhood, in our motherhood, and to begin to treasure the core things, um, the softness, the empathy, those are the things that are so important. And like I know April said in the marriage segment, women, if I could say one thing, don't put down your men, lift them up. If we could just work together, we'd be unstoppable. And so this is the message, you know, to fight for your marriage, wait on God. Um, if you find yourself in a bad situation, there's so much help out there. It's not being portrayed honestly. And the other message is too, you know, working together. We have to work together. There's far too many people dying. There's far too many people that, that don't feel loved. They feel judged. And, you know, we're going to stand before God one day. And if we're not if we need to talk to people and we're not telling them the truth, it's going to be revealed on Judgment Day. I mean, people act like this stuff isn't being written down. It's being written down. Our actions, our words are being written down. This is why the Lord says, do not judge someone. Yeah, why don't we just pick up a phone and, and talk to them? Because there could be a chance where we're wrong about so-and-so. And I had a post-abortive woman say to me two days ago, that she is so grieved by how post-abortive women are judged. And, you know, the Pope John Paul, St. John Paul, said they are some of the best, most effective defenders of life. The, when repentance come in, comes in, Brian, think of that repentance. When a woman realizes what she's done. Trish, let me jump in for a second here because you said something the lady felt she was judged, which she probably has or is. But as I traveled around the country, it wasn't uncommon for women to come up to me afterwards and say that they were post-abortive. And, you know, forgiveness is a big part of the message of divine mercy. Yes. And we, we say it's a way of life, the trust in God and the role of suffering, being merciful, but forgiveness is like paramount in all this, but women don't forgive themselves or men, mm -hmm. you know, and that's a big part problem too, isn't it? Yes. Many of these women who are post-abortive now, say 20 years or whatever, I think they're, they have an especially hard time because they were taught, they have some teaching, um, there was a morality, right? And we don't have that today. Yeah, yeah. And one thing I enjoyed about the documentary was that it um, talked a lot of different themes. There's the, the feminism uh, mm -hmm. idea, the adoption, the things available to families. You know, several years ago, I remember in our community, one of my liberal friends had written something that kind of broke my heart. But he said, you know, you guys all speak about this pro-life, but you don't do anything about it. You're not there to mm -hmm. help the women. Mm -hmm. You found that to be the case or are there, um, what am I thinking of? Are there resources available to help these women in this time of need? Well, that's one of the things we, I think, as far as misled, I think people are, uh, the women are misled about, in the, in, especially in the feminist movement. You know, they're getting across the idea 
um, that this is the only solution. And so we did profile, you know, people like Mark Hall, you know, the PRCs, what's actually going on behind the scenes, what's actually going on in front life and frontline work, you know, what's actually going on in outreach educational ministries, um, Cheryl Lynn's in the African American community, um, Destiny, who was the um, new wave feminist at the very beginning. She is in, at the border, I believe, right now. She's building um, a house for women for safety and so they won't be abducted, trafficked. She does a lot to help women in unplanned pregnancies. The, um, I guess the pro-abortion people, she went to the Women's March and she has tactics that I think are, are you know, in a heart just for everybody. And I think that's what it's going to take, too, is we think we have this little box that we stay in and we actually have to be very creative and to reach the lost. And that's what we tried to do with this is show every type of person, uh, background, you know, walking this out in creative ways. You know, Jay and April spoke on marriage. They do a load of Catholic events for young people and uh, for the church. And um, so I, I know in uh, Sherilyn's case, she's Baptist and she works a lot in her community. So we really tried to show the different people out there uh, wow. working in all these different ways. And I think that's so important that we pull together talents and resources. So getting the message out uh, when someone asks you that question is important. Getting the message out that there is help, right? There's help out there. If people just go to their in within their own communities, look to the local PRC, they can go to, for instance, Harpeen International or CareNet, and they can put them in touch with the PRC in their area for crisis pregnancy help. And I think those kinds of uh, things, messages have to get out, but also the message that the safety of family is so important. Um, the uplifting the men, uplifting the women and being and protecting them again. The women to rediscover that heart of womanhood, which is something when we pray a rosary, I pray to the Blessed Mother about this all the time, because women have hardened and they've hardened in response to the men leaving the home, uh, to being used. And so many of these women, they'll get pregnant one time and the husband will leave and they're waiting for the replacement dad. That guy comes in, he tells them he loves them, so on and so forth. He uses, he leaves, they end up at a clinic. They don't know how they can do it. So I think to regain these, um, these core values by watching what other people are doing uh, to help that and to put out that message that there is help out there, it just takes, it takes all of us in our communities and wherever we're at, it takes all of us. Trish, you mentioned trafficking and Tampa is a hotbed of sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I look at it as like, this is just part and parcel. It's not surprising. It's a consequence of our lack of respect for human life. Everybody's just a disposable thing that can be thrown away, including yes. The, the small human being that is, they're told is just a glob of cells and, um, you know, all this gun violence, you know, I, reducing guns may help, but that's not the problem. It's that life is disposable. And um, yes, comment on that, if you would. Well, to me, you know, that was first and foremost for the final um, documentary to be done. I, I, we not only prayed for, but we had to, absolutely had to believe that we were defending women in the best way we knew how and trying to help them show their value and show the value of motherhood and life and show them that there is help. I think people feel abandoned. I think all of this has uh, grown out of, you know, the, the sexual revolution, birth control, um, you know, fatherless homes, all of this led to violence and abuse. And this was, of course, foretold us. So I think that this cheapening of life we have seen on every single level. And I, I pray that somebody looks at this and sees the beauty of life. I, you know, 
April and Jane's testimony, how powerful um, to see in a crisis pregnancy and that he made a decision um, at that point and she had a lot of family support. Uh, Jay had a different story than hers, but that just goes to show you that when you have that family support, when you have a strong family, then everything good is possible when you have that rock, you know, which is Christ. For people that don't know Christ, you know, at the same token, just to have that sense of morality will lead them to the truth. And this comes from the safety of a home, Brian. I, I honestly believe when you see so many divorces, you know, what's the message to the children when you see alcoholism, drug addiction, all these kinds of things in the home, and the sexualization of the culture where people think that this is normal, then any kind of horrible thing is possible. And that's what we're seeing. So we have to push back. Um, we, have to, we have to continually push back. We tried to make this a very loving piece, Brian, because we, we wanted people to feel the love of the people who participated in this, a personal walk, a personal commitment, um, uh, not people looking to build ministries, but people who are uh, just quietly doing their work and working, you know what I mean? You mentioned uh, drug addiction and alcoholism and being a liver specialist, I saw a lot of alcoholics studied the 12 step program and um, the, the doctor and the stockbroker that started Alcoholics Anonymous had befriended a Catholic nun and you can see a lot of elements of uh, Ignatian spirituality in the 12 steps, but they took out Jesus Christ. They, they said mm -hmm. a higher power and it's reaching mm -hmm. more people. You know, I think it was a brilliant move to keep re religion out of it. Um, this isn't a Catholic issue and it's really not a political issue. It's a moral yes. issue. Again, going through this film, share with us again, what you've learned and, and are you guys ready now to be launched out and we're we're ready. We want to take it out, and um, that's why we waited on the Lord for the right message. Um, it's interesting that He decided to release the right people and all the people just before Roe v. Wade, and the pro life movement and the issue has changed since Roe. And um, even one of the principal people involved in this 25 years ago called me after she saw it, and she said, "You know." that first cut you had that you know would have gotten rid of the a feeling of that obligation to put it out but she said it wouldn't have gone anywhere because it was it looked like everything else that was out there when you think of 25 years ago brian everyone in the pro-life movement probably 95 to 98 percent were catholics some evangelicals so we sort of had a who's who of the first people who were really fighting it and everybody everyone was doing videos with them and uh, that didn't bother me. Uh, what bothered me is when this very talented editor with, with quite a resume said, it doesn't go with your title. So um, I think in taking it out, that message, women don't like being lied to. We do not. And we have been lied to. And we've been lied to across the board. And so I think um, just getting that message out there that this isn't the truth and we love you and look at how these other people discovered it and look at how they're walking it out in love that you're valued and so it's interesting that people on the fence that have seen this has said they're completely rethought it didn't know any of this stuff and that's what we tried to do and to take it out i think would be so powerful we've been told um We've been hearing things like, this is new, it's, it's different, it hasn't been done before. And, um, and we tried to plug into now, Brian, what's going on right now for such a time as this. I think that people are ready to hear, there's so many people on the fence that are ready to hear it. How many people in Catholic churches have abortions? How many Christians have abortions? It's actually a very high number of, of, of post-abortive people that um, identified as Christian. This is a tragedy, and clearly they don't know their worth or the worth of that child. Clearly they don't understand what they've given away. 
I, when you mentioned the adoption, the young woman who was so traumatized in the beginning, who had gone through a, an adoption, an open adoption, 20 some years ago. And we didn't want to discount her testimony. That was very hard for her. And so we went to an adoption professional and we followed up with two other uh, testimonies. We had, it's adoption was so important, Brian, to highlight because I can tell you as, as a post-abortive mother of two, as a very young woman, that you can't look down the road when you're in the crisis. And even with this young woman, she's, she still isn't down the road to see that she had her child, she gave him up for adoption. She doesn't have those grandchildren yet or great-grandchildren yet. She doesn't get to see that her bloodline is going to continue. There's a legacy that's going to come through that child, you know, and uh, ha being post-abortive so young, losing my other son, Sean, my grandchildren, we were great-grandparents very young. They give me so much joy. You know what I mean? It's, it's the, the, life continuing and to see how they develop and to see what they bring to the family is so powerful. And there's going to come a day for every post-abortive woman, something's going to remind her because a lot of them say, I don't feel that yet. Well, wait a minute, wait till you hit your sixties or your fifties, sixties. And you look at that Thanksgiving table, you look, look at Christmas time and there's nobody there or there's, there's places at the table that are empty. You are not thinking about this as, you know, the entire scope of what you just did. That child had something so unique to give. That child represented the grandchildren you were going to have and the generations that were going to flow and that were going to give you so much joy, you know, so... They don't see that. So for the women out there that are in crisis pregnancies, there's so many types of adoptions. There's so many professionals that can help them. Choose the right situation for them. We wanted to really hit that home. And we got a lot of comments on that adoption segment in Ms. Lett. You know, at the end of the day, women are put in a difficult position. And uh, I tell my own kids in times of strife, you know, this is only chapter 20 of your book. It may not be a pretty chapter, but you've got many, many chapters more to come and, and you know, do what's best and right and uh, walk close to God and it'll all work out in the end. Well, Trish, you've done a tremendous job with Matt, your husband, and um, any closing thoughts on this before we wrap up today's show? I'm praying people will watch it because um, there's something in it for them. Um, it not only speaks to the women who are misled, but it also speaks to what are we doing to help the situation. I think the themes of repentance in action are so strong that we really can't judge a situation on its surface. And one of the ways we can all be pro-life is to not judge. You know, um, We never know where somebody came from. We never know what they're dealing with. And if you were blessed to come from a beautiful family that was protect that protected you, then um, you know you have a great, even a greater responsibility, right? Because we don't see that so much in the culture, and we see the backlash from it. So I hope people will watch it, see the love in it, um, that it, we really delve deep into people's lives and what they are doing that's creative to help this problem. The education is there. Uh, we tried very hard to put statistics and and um, and the doctor's studies and things are all at the end. And I think the stories are fresh and different. We tried to tell them from a different point of view, but mostly that you can share this, you know, with your family. People, I think the fact it's not religious, Brian, and the fact it comes from such a loving place, but yet hits the hard truth. People are telling me they're showing it to their families who are on the fence. And they're getting incredible results. We're getting incredible um, remarks from people that they feel that those who are on the fence, who are pro-choice, 
will take a second look at this and, uh, and understand that we haven't been told everything and that there are wonderful people out there trying to help the women, you know? Right, right. You know, at the end of the day, we have to remember that um, God hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. Amen. And uh, Trish, you and Matt have done a beautiful job on this documentary. We'll have a link to this in our summary of the blog uh, when this airs. And uh, people, I just want to thank you for watching this show. Please share it, spread it. Let's get this thing going um, all over the internet and the world. And um, God is love. And remember the words of Martin Luther King, uh, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only life can. And hatred cannot drive out hatred, only love can. So we need to be loving to all these people and uh, we continue to speak the truth. People, thank you again for watching this show. Trish, thanks for being with me today on Mercy and Bound. God bless to everybody. Thank you so and, much. Uh, Let's spread the truth, Brian. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel for the video portion. The podcast can be heard at anchor.fm slash drbryan, B-R-Y-A-N, Thatcher, T-H-A-T-C-H-E-R, and on all the major podcast forums. I would love to speak at your church or conference, and please consider supporting our efforts to spread the truth to a hurting world. Thank you again. And for more information, go to the website at drbryanthatcher.com.